Hi, I'm Julia. I'm Rachel. And I'm Kelly. And this is What You Should Read. The podcast where we should all over our books. And today we have a special bonus episode. We'll be talking to Sonali Dev, uh, author of Pride, Prejudice, and Other Flavors and Recipe for Persuasion, as well as her forthcoming book in the Rajas series, um, Incense and Sensibility. So we actually just finished talking to her and it, she is a delight. Yes. So I'm uh, excited for everyone to, to hear this episode. So without further ado, here is our interview with Sonali Dave. You know what you know what you should read? You know what you should read? You know what you should read? It's time for What You Should Read. The podcast all about the titles you need. Join three book lovers and a guest as they cover all the best new titles to enjoy with your tea. I have that, but I haven't read it yet. <laughs> and we are back and we are joined today by author Sonali Devs. Hi, Sonali. How are you? Hi, Julia. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to talk to you. Um, and Rachel and Kelly. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> They're here too. They're here too. <laughs> um, so Sonali, tell our listeners um, who you are and what books you write. Uh, so I am, uh, as Julia said, Sonali Dave. And um, I write um, what I think of as um, what what I used to think of as Bollywood movies in a book, but that's probably um, a really bad description of what I write. I think, um, you know, I, I write romances, uh, so love stories that are set within, um, you know, larger family sagas. So in my mind, I write family sagas, you know, with a strong spine of love stories. So somewhere between romances and women's fiction, basically just really messed up people who find happiness. Love it. And your your most recent books are uh, Jane Austen retellings. So you have a Pride and Prejudice retelling, Pride, Prejudice, and Other Flavors, and also uh, a Persuasion retelling, Recipe for Persuasion. And um, all of your books, and these books are centered around the, the Rajesh family. And so I'm curious to know if the kernel for the idea for these books started with the family, or did you think that you wanted to write a Pride and Prejudice retelling and then the, the ideas stemmed from there? So it's usually with me a mess. Um, and I, I can never, um, you know, really um, tell you exactly where the genesis of a particular book was because it's um, so many pieces. But um, but with the Rajas, the, the series, which starts with Pride, Prejudice and Other Flavors and then has Recipe for Persuasion. And then there's Incense and Sensibility coming out this year. And then the Emma retelling, which is, you know, which doesn't have a title yet next year. So um, I grew up um, reading Jane Austen. I was introduced to her in sixth or seventh grade was the first time I read her. And hopefully we'll get to talk about that experience Um in another question, but I'll try to keep this short. Um, I, I, it, it, simplest way to say this is that she changed my life. And so um, I just, you know, we, I wasn't seeing a whole lot of, um, we were reading a lot of classics um, and even the Indian stories around us that, you know, Bollywood films, all of that. Uh, didn't have too many female protagonists and didn't have women who um, who seemed to have any self-worth. And this was the first time um, I read I read female protagonists who wanted something, got it, and didn't die, you know, a sad death or go crazy. And so, you know, and end up in a in an asylum. So it was it, it was seeing something in a book that I in, that I inherently felt inside myself, which I wasn't seeing reflected too much around my world, but I knew to be true and, you know, just as a base belief. And so that was, you know, across 200 years, this her, her words touched me in that way. And so I always knew and I always wanted to be a writer and I always knew that that was going, you know, that was something I wanted to do. I wanted to, you know, to do something with those stories. And then, um, you know, of course it's been done so much. And by the time I, you know, was a writer and not just a child thinking, 
someday I'll be living in a cabin somewhere <laughs> overlooking the ocean writing, which by the way, hasn't happened yet. <laughs> uh, but, you know, when I was a, was a working um, writer, I, Bride, Bride and Prejudice had already been done. Bridget Jones' Diary had been done. So, you know, there, there was a lot of, I mean, it was actually a subgenre, Jane yeah. Austen retellings. And, um, and, and I knew that that was not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to just take the, the book scene by scene and swap them out with a different time and culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I have enjoyed books like that. You know, I'm not, this is not me trying to say that that is easy to do or anything, but that was not my intent. I wanted to take the things I had learned from her work as a person, the personally, you know, important themes from her work and translate them into completely my own stories. Mm -hmm. And that's where these books came from. And then of course, you know, um, there's, there's this other mishmash that goes on in your head. I um, always wanted to um, not continue to reinforce this whole poverty form that goes with South Asian literature, which is not to say that it's, those are not important stories to tell either, but they they shouldn't be the only stories told, right? And Mm -hmm. I want, there is a whole uh, class and privilege um, thing going on in South Asian culture that, you know, also transfers uh, with migration, with immigration. And so those were, and those are the stories I've always, you know, gravitated toward or I was at that phase in my life gravitated that I hope that will change and so there will be you know new and different stories but that's kind of where the Rajas came from because I wanted to explicitly examine privilege which again tied you know ties in came from a place of of um, Jane Austen's themes which I think are a lot about uh, class and um you know, the culture that goes with class. And so I wanted to explicitly um, examine prejudices. And Darcy, I think, is Mr. Darcy is a character who um, who embodies the height of privilege of his time. And so I wanted, uh, and of course, again, a whole different conversation about can we in 2020, you know, 2019, write a woman who is that um, comfortable with his own awesomeness or his own privilege and so that's where Trisha came from and to to give Trisha the you know the the gifts of Darcy which is you know forms the basis of her character of his character uh, somewhat and forms the conflict of the book I had to give I, I actually listed out all the privilege of our time and um and and you know that was wealth and brilliance uh you know um, generational, uh, generational nobility, you know, so, yeah. so generational um, markers of class. So royal, that's where the royalty comes from. That's kind of how the Rajas formed along with my fascination growing up for the royal families of India. That's kind of a very long answer wow. <laughs> to your question. I- No, that's amazing. And I do love how in Pride, Prejudice and Other Flavors, you do take the, it's a gender swap. So the, the Darcy character is, is Trisha and she, um, she is the, and it's also told from her point of view. So I thought that also gave it just, like you said, you're not taking the story and retelling it kind of scene by scene in a new time and culture, but uh, taking the themes and what you've learned from those books and telling it through this new lens. And I'm curious, you said that Jane Austen changed your life. Was it Pride and Prejudice that you read first and then you just read all of them? Or what's your, what's, tell us more about your history with the books. So it's really interesting. And I hadn't, um, you know, hadn't really realized uh, that my first experience with Austen was a retelling so this was I was in sixth grade seventh grade um and there was an Indian tv show called Trishna which was a retelling of Jane Austen that was on tv now mind you this is not television with 7,000 channels 24 7. This is back in the 80s when you know we had um, I think we were still at a few hours a day of one channel and so so a tv show was completely this new thing a tv serial as we you know called it back then was a completely new thing and you know got a lot of media attention and it was you know it, it was it was this 
uh, cutting edge thing. And so, so Trishna was, um, was an Indian, was a scene by scene retelling. And it was, um, you know, I think Lizzie Bennett's character was named Rekha. This was a really long time ago, but she, I think was the first time that I saw this woman who did not pander at all uh, to the men around her, who was very opinionated, Hmm. very contrary, and uh, didn't apologize for it, and in the end was loved for it. So this kind of just shook up my brain in a way I cannot explain to you. And so, you know, here was, because all of my messaging was that you needed to be, uh, you needed to, you know, to be liked, you needed to, what is the word I'm looking for? Con- conform, you needed to conform, right. which is not to say that, you know, Lizzie Bennett is non-conformist, but conform in the ways of being soft-spoken, being the things that are appealing, you know, to um, to the opposite sex, to elders, all of that. And so there was this whole cultural expectation, um, which which Rekha broke in a very um, n- almost non-violent way that really spoke to me and uh, in this very natural way to me. And so, so, so I was like, what is this thing, you know? <laughs> and um, and th- there was all this talk in these news articles about how this was a retelling of Pride and Prejudice. And so I ran to my library, my school library, and picked up uh, Pride and Prejudice and other uh, Pride and Prejudice, and um, and it uh, changed my life. I was like, "This is amazing!" And of course, oh. you know, the romanticism of it for a you know for a ch- person that age, all of it was just magic for me. The humor, all that, and so um, and then you know that led to persuasion and sense and sensibility and Emma, which have always been my four favorite of her books. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And I think there might, that's probably why there are so many Pride and Prejudice retellings because of the, the fact that the main character subverts those gender norms of her time. And yeah. while the gender expectations have changed and are different across cultures, there always are those expectations. <laughs> and so subverting I them is always- I don't even think they're that different across cultures. That's I true. I think they're silent <laughs> in some places and more yeah. overt in other places. And mm. again, a whole different conversation, you know, si- silent misogyny almost feels harder to address than overt misogyny. Because yeah. if you're, you know, if you're able to point to social customs about how you treat your daughters differently, then you have something to change. Mm-hmm. When you live in a culture uh, like ours here, when it is so subtle that it's the deniability level becomes, you know, that much easier and that much higher. So that's such a good point. Um, we actually did an episode last year that was all about our favorite Pride and Prejudice retellings. And it was right before your book, per, uh, Recipe for Persuasion came out. And it was so funny because we were, during that episode, we were like, you know, we love all these retellings of Pride and Prejudice, but it would be great if someone would write a, a persuasion retelling. We'd really <laughs> love that. And then literally the next day we saw your book had come out. We were like, well, we're magic. <laughs> So, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. So thank you for, you know, granting our wish. Um, so I went out. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so I went out and bought it immediately and loved it. And I, um, I have one more question from me before I turn it over to Rachel. Just that book um, follows Ash- Ashna um, and her story. And while there is the love story there, what I was really taken by was the relationship with her mom and how you explored that dynamic. And I was curious if when you were writing it, you knew you wanted to really delve into that mother daughter relationship, um, and her backstory, or if that kind of evolved as you were writing it. Um, absolutely. Um, it was the story. Um, I, I, you know, when I'm writing a book, I always feel like this is the book I was born to write. And I feel mm-hmm. like um, Recipe for Persuasion is so much uh, my feminine rage. I think of all my books, there's, a, of course, every new one you write, you know, the, the great gift is that you feel that way about all your books. But but when I was writing it, there was a lot of me in there. Mm-hmm. And um, 
And I, the, the, the place that that came from, I think for me was um, this, this trope in, um, again, Bollywood films and even personal stories around me growing up that basically went like this. A woman or, or a young girl falls in love um, with someone her family uh, deems you know, wrong for her. She is then forced into marriage with someone the family deems right for her. And when she, um, you know, when she accepts that sanctity of marriage and when she basically puts her head down and accepts her lot in life, she finds happiness. I always found this preposterous, like something <laughs> inside me was just, that is a horrible, horrible story to be telling me and all the young girls that you know i mean should should we have some you know all human beings need need to accept things and, and of course acceptance right. is a huge part of life but but when you are overtly you know feeding us this nonsense intravenously it's just and and fooling us into believing these things it just it felt like that it felt like i was being cheated it felt like i was being you know mm. slipped something uh, that was to make society easy, to make life of others easy, and um, and so I always, so so I always have a problem with this, you know, with the arranged marriage trope, um, where wherein uh, the trope is that I don't have a problem with arranged marriages. I have a very successful one myself, but. But of course, again, that is a very complicated cultural thing. It's not yeah. simply your parents forcing you in to marry someone right. you don't want to marry. The problem is with um, with your choice not being deemed the best thing for you. Mm. That others know f- what is better for you than you do. And mm. therefore, voila, you know, the people that your dad and your, you know, uh, family picked for you is was actually better for you than uh, you know who you would have chosen for yourself and your own feelings and desires so I so Shobi is for me the answer to that and there was some sort of overlap in my head between persuasion where she makes a mistake young and gets a chance to correct it and I think those two things are related a lot of those stories tell yeah. you that you're not allowed to make mistakes you know it, we have we you know these things about don't let your foot slip right you know making because then you go hurtling into an abyss of despair and you know uh and and misery and so 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 there was always inside my head this dive in between second chances and um you know so what if we choose wrong for ourselves right there is that other thing there should be a way for that to be fixed that's what divorce is about (laughs) and so marriage uh you know shouldn't be that one chance for you to get it right that's the patriarchy and so um so so that's kind of where recipe for persuasion comes from those two con you know concepts mingling and and just this idea of uh you know we are our mothers and you know how each generation has the same um experiences but because the women before us have fought and have you know pushed back we are able to t- do different things with those experiences and that that sense of standing on the shoulders of the women who came before us that's i think where recipe persuasion comes from wow that's great thank you yeah. for sharing that yeah i definitely um i love that concept of people should be allowed to make mistakes and you know learn from them um so uh, yeah, I love your books and, um, you know, the third one coming out in Sense and Sensibility. And then you said there, there's an Emma one. And um, I'm just curious, like where you're doing all these Jane Austen retellings. And I, I also love Jane Austen and, and relate to her characters a lot. And I read, um, you had written something for the end of the, this book that you related to her characters a lot. Um, so I just, I thought that was, um, really cool to read. Um, but I'm wondering if there's any like other like classical authors or authors that you would be interested in seeing a retelling from some of their books in more of a modern cross-cultural setting. I, I almost, you know, I had never thought of it, um, this way, but I was at a signing once and I had a reader come up to me and say, 
well, it's great how you're bringing these stories to the new generation. These are stories they would never have read. And I had never thought of it that way because, you know, A, I don't really think of these as those exact stories, right? They're just inspired by those stories. But having said that, the kernel of the story or the heart of that story, there is really no new story, right? You're writing, um, it's it's basically what there's like three plots or whatever. There's these <laughs> theories, but, but I mean, you know, essentially every story is a person is in, you know, a person doesn't like who they are, or they're in a situation they don't like, and then a person finds a way to like who they are, or change the situation, right, or die trying. Mm -hmm. So that's basically every story. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so having said that, I love um, some of the, you know, I love this whole culture of retellings that we're living in. Um, and there's been some really great stuff. There was, um, Gosh, I'm trying to think. Meg Donahue, who did uh, Wuthering Heights last year, oh. and I think our books, um, it's really gorgeous. Uh, it's, gosh, I'm going to, By the Sea, it's it's something by the sea, or it, that's the kind of title. I'll, I'll look it up, but it's uh, Meg Donahue, and she did it, and I think our Pride Prejudice and Other Flavors, and that book came out on the same day, in fact, I think. Mm -hmm. Or one of my two books came out on the same day as Meg's. And um, and it's really, really lovely in a way that is atmospheric. You know, she, she captures some of that whole. Now, Wuthering Heights is a complicated uh, book for me, as I think it is for everybody who reads mm -hmm. it. It's, 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 it's so much nonsense in mm -hmm. so many ways. It's as a love story, I think it is completely, you know, nonsense but as as at, at a macro level but at a micro level where she talks about feelings where she digs into that relationship um you know it has some of the most romantic lines it has some of the most uh, beautiful explorations of the act of love and of the feeling of love so in those ways i think at the, you know at the um at the detailed level it's a very beautiful book mm -hmm. at the expansive level it you know we can call it nonsense today because we don't live in a time where you know insanity was uh, the only way that a woman could be with the man again that you know would could make the choices she wanted and so so there is of course there's that there but but that's exactly what I think Meg has done a really good job translating so she has um you know been able to really get into that what is deemed right for you by society and by family and um and and this person who just makes you feel a certain way who is just part of your soul and nobody can do anything about it and it comes with a certain kind of life and it comes with you know with uh, backing up your choices and um and there's just something beautiful about that and fortunately in in a you know in in our time that's a book you can write and you know and and um Kathy can have that and so it's um so I love that I love that because that's almost like this travel through human history itself right this is what we could do with the story this is what Charlotte Bronte could do with that story and here is what Meg Donahue can do with that story because the world itself has changed um you know in these ways so so there's a lot of it um Virginia Cantra has done the um, has done the Little Women retelling. Mm -hmm. So her first one is Megan Joe, and she's Beth and Amy comes out this year. And in fact, I have it on my Kindle because I have an arc, and um, and I loved Megan Joe. And I, you know, I know there's a lot of I I loved Little Women growing up, and um, you know, it had its own uh, whole sisterhood thing going on, which which was really um, important to me. And again, she's been able to, you know, put, make those conflicts so relevant, you know, to today and make what it means, you know, to be a mother raising four girls in, in her own um, conflicted or in her own life and marriage and how all of that works together. It's just, I, I think Virginia does an amazing job too. So this is, it's it's lovely to see that change, to see what what was important then and what is important today. Mm. And in some ways, nothing has changed. In some ways, everything has changed. Um, mm. So I think that's the true beauty of uh, this whole retelling culture. Absolutely, I totally agree. I also loved Megan Joe. I thought that yeah. was really well done. 
Yeah. I, I would love Sonali to see you um, explore the themes of little women oh, yeah. <laughs> and sisterhood. I would love that. That would be great. <laughs> just, uh, just an idea. <laughs> oh, me? I thought you were talking to Rachel. <laughs> no, you. Yeah. I, you. <laughs> I mean, I do. You know, I was thinking about that today. I think Pride, Prejudice and Other Flavors is a little bit a sister book because yeah. there is a lot of Nisha and Trisha in there. Mm-hmm. But I have, you know, I, I I was just thinking about this the other day. Not that I'm going to retell Little Women. I think it's been beautifully done. And, uh, you know, but I don't have a, like real sisters. And I know I don't have a sister. I have a I have one female cousin who has been like a sister growing up. And I think about her as my sister. Yeah. And of course, we, you know, fight like real sisters and love each other like real sisters. But um. But yeah, I haven't. That's uh, it's 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 strange that it's one of those things, right? When something's going on in your head, the world around you reflects that, and people will sure. say. So I have, yeah. It would be that. That's a that seems like probably the most explored, uh, you know, theme in today's literature. You know, sisters and yeah. their relationships, and mothers and daughters. But those two, and I've done mothers and daughters. I you know, recipe was that, but certainly yeah yeah well yeah. maybe we've manifested your your next series <laughs> we'll see um no little women won't happen <laughs> i think i think retellings um yeah in in general there is a sweet spot and i might i might pass that if i continue to do that sure. <laughs> Um, So speaking of of the books you're actually writing, so Incense and Sensibility comes out July 6th, correct? Yes. Um, And we know it follows um, the brother, um, Yash. And so what can you tell us about about this new installment? So if since you've read, um, you know, the first books, you, I don't know how you feel about Yash, but generally he is one of those characters who very, very naturally and automatically, as soon as he was on the page, he would take over the scene. Mm. So he was just, you know, a joy as a writer. He is one of those gift characters uh, who was just, has was so much fun to write even in the first two books but we only see him through his uh, sister's points of view. Mm-hmm. And of course, sister's love interests points of view, but his, how his family sees him, how the world sees him. And in a way, he's the spine of the series because the series kicks off with the gubernatorial race, uh, you know, being announced and the series will end with, you know, the election. And mm-hmm. so he's kind of the, you know, the, the spine and uh, he appears to be this person who has everything really well sorted out, right? His life sorted out. He knows exactly what he wants. And what is more fun uh, for a storyteller than to have a character who has that as their perceived external persona and be a complete mess on the inside mm-hmm. and so that's Yash in a nutshell um, because his whole um, his whole personality has been repressing anything that gets in his way or in the way of his family's dreams in ways of in in, in the way of anything he considers responsible and so uh, he's had challenges that he has just squished right to the bottom uh, you know of his rather magnificent abs <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it it's um it's time for it to erupt um in um you know those two things together a whole different visual but but he's at he's running this campaign it's three months before um the election and um there's a there's a hate crime which i you know is um very much currently a, 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 an important, I think, thing in our world to consider. And uh, there's, a, there's a shooting at a rally, basically an assassination attempt. And his, um, his bodyguard, who is also, you know, someone he's friends with, because he works with him every day, is, takes a bullet for him and, uh, you know, goes into 
a, a coma that nobody really knows if he's going to come out of. And so um, here is this man who feels so um, empowered by his dreams, who uh, sees nothing but his path, that suddenly finds that his path has disappeared, that everything he believed about the world and about what he was doing is, you know, just gone. And uh, he doesn't know how to handle that. And of course, so much of it has to do with how much he has repressed and never um, pulled out and bothered to heal. And uh, he starts having these panic attacks and can't campaign anymore. He can't go out, you know, wow. in, on a stage again. And um, and the three months to uh, voting day. And so the this becoming uh, this could end his campaign, if the getting out in the me- in the media. And the only way his family thinks of um, being able to address this is for him to see someone. Now he refuses to go see um, you know a therapist and not make that public because he's in the middle of a campaign. And his sister's best friend, we see uh, China and India Dashwood a little bit in uh, recipe. And so Ashna has seen India for her own panic attacks. So this is you know someone they know, they trust. And um, so, it seems like the, the the best course of action is for him to go see India, who of course he has this history with, uh, you know, which uh, is whole is is part of his whole repression um, pattern. And she's the only one who can help him. And she is a yoga guru and a stress management coach. And you know, this person who lives in the moment very much lives the life of wholeness and wellness and the you know and healing and the exact opposite of uh, what Yash is and therefore is the absolute perfect fit for him and so uh, the the kicker because he is Edward Ferris is that we've seen that Yash is engaged uh, you know well he has been with someone for 10 years not engaged but has been with um, with someone for 10 years so for the whole world to see he is with someone um and there's a whole story about what that is about. And of course, so they cannot. And in India's eyes, this is a guy who chose this other person 10 years ago over her. And uh, now he's back and she's she's un- she has never turned anyone away that she can help. And so there's, um, I do completely love these characters because um, again, you know, a, a tortured hero is... <laughs> always the most fabulous thing to write and um you know and, and, a, and a woman i think india is very different from any character i've written um you know her levels of anger he's she is just so um so comfortable with herself and with everything like the way she processes the world is really really beautiful and i haven't had a chance to write a character who is you know, so okay with the world and yet so not. Um, so it's been, it's really been fun uh, to write her. And also I think, you know, the way that yoga is perceived um, today and the way that yoga teachers are perceived or written thus far, I think you'll find something completely new and different with um, with India. And I have arts and I can have them sent to you. Oh, yeah. that would be so nice. Yeah, yes, I'm so please. excited. Uh, yeah <laughs> I've been it so curious so, yeah it sounds yeah. really good I've been so curious about Yash and that relationship too so I'm really I'm really excited mm-hmm. yeah it's it's yes it's 100% Yash um so there's <laughs> that nice <laughs> I'm so concerned about the bodyguard <laughs> like no. No. He, he's good he's gonna yeah. be okay right <laughs> And you haven't even heard the worst of it uh, when he gets shot because you wonder, you know, what is with this Yashka and someone getting shot and him losing his mind? Um, so oh. the bodyguard has, uh, his wife is still in the hospital after giving birth to their first child. Oh. So there's oh. that Yash has just been to see them. And so there's this whole kind of, um, and um, it, it's, you're, it, it, I got to say, things I wanted to say with with those two they're really lovely lovely couple so Abdul and um, Arzu and their new little baby Naz so it's kind of just um, yeah I think I think that readers will really connect with that whole thing can't wait I'm not gonna make it am I (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, Kelly, you're up, so. <laughs> um, well, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> okay. I write despair, okay. but I write, fi- you know, dis- I write the fixing of despair. At least yeah. I try. You should put that on your uh, on your promo materials because that's actually amazing. <laughs> fixing of despair. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I wish real life was like that too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Um, well, first, I love that you write series because if there are characters I love, you cannot make the book long enough. Like, just mm-hmm. let me live in this world forever. Um, so thank you for that. Um, but I know you do a Bollywood series, but also the Jane Austen inspired ones. Mm-hmm. Um, which of those is your favorite to write? Oh, and gosh. I, I don't know if that's impossible, but I mean, it's it's completely. I mean, next you're going to ask me which of my two kids is my favorite. Uh, and I really, yes, I, am. <laughs> I would love and, to know. I I always tell them that you know the 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 standard parental answer, which is that I love you both in. Um, unique ways <laughs> but I do feel like that is um that's an impossible question and that is very much the you know that that uh, comparison is is very uh valid because mm-hmm. there's no way there's just you know there is uh, y- you could get me started about or maybe I'm blessed and really really fortunate that um, I, I don't have that. I am told by author friends who have written more books that a time will come when I will write a book simply because um, I'm on contract for it and I have no option but to push through and, you know, pull my big girl panties on and I don't have, you know, but but um, every book is a labor of love and every character, you know, at some point, I, I, I keep thinking about these old um, books or stories about authors who you know at one point are not able to contain the characters and worlds they've created within their own brain and so it causes um you know mental illness and I wonder you know if if that is not an entirely un because the, these characters continue to live in a very very real way sometimes I know more about them than I know about real people I know so it is an absolutely impossible question uh, to answer there are different things I think from reader from a reader perspective you know I I hope that all of the books work for all people but but it to some extent I think that um that there is a there's a difference in um in in what the stories are of course, the first four books, um, which are the Bollywood. So again, that's not only change of heart and distant heart are truly series. And Bollywood Bride is kind of, you know, could be considered that they all uh, stand alone. A Bollywood Affair is um, thus far my only completely independent um, book. Although I make, I do this little nod to them at the end of um, the fourth one, just because... I, I wanted to kind of tie them all together but um but but those are much more traditional Bollywood films in a book so they are Bollywood style love stories in their purest you know they're they're over the top the conflicts are really large you know you should feel you know operatic Bollywood music burst in your head like that's you know if, if you can imagine where the choruses happen and you know so it's that it's very much stylistically that and it works for some people and it doesn't I feel like the Rajas is, is um you know in that way more new Bollywood which is not like old Bollywood you know which is much more melting pot much more um you know a larger cast of characters and um, a larger cast of relationships, which are there in the Bollywood books, but but the focus is very squarely on the central couple. And I will also say that within the Rajay books, the uh, Pride, Prejudice and Other Flavors and uh, Recipe for Persuasion are more large canvas than in Sense and Sensibility and um, the Emma book, which are more, which are going to be more traditionally romance in structure. Mm. So that was your (laughs) non-answer. So uh, which of your kids? (laughs) The Um, one who's in the room currently. Yes. Yes. Nice. Um, And also, and I, 
I feel like this has been the best Sunday in quite a while, but also we're keeping you from working, which I don't know how I feel about that, but <laughs> kind of badly. Yes, because before we started this, I just told these lovely ladies how they can take all my time because I'm looking for ways to procrastinate writing. <laughs> so you're very kind, Kelly. <laughs> and procrastinators are my people. Oh, sorry, what? I said, and a taskmaster, so thank you. <laughs> I mean, procrastinators are my people, but um, what what are you working on now? Can you say? So I am working on the Emma book. I'm okay. at, and you know, we were talking about, you, you were talking about, about book length and, um, and it's, it's, this book has been, oh, I'm going to get done with this within the next couple of days for the past month. <laughs> and so that's kind of where I am. And um, yeah, it's, um, I, I always think I'm going to, 90,000, 95,000, and then, you know, 120,000 uh, <laughs> later, you're like, okay, but yeah, that's what I'm working on. And I'm pretty close to finishing up the pretty close <laughs> to finishing up uh, the first draft, which means I will rewrite it 100 times. But that's my hard part of the process. Um, yeah. Once that is out, then I'm like, I got this. <laughs> but until then, I'm like, somebody please help. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, wait. Yeah. <laughs> and also we always like to ask um, everyone who comes on, uh, what should, what should we read? What, what recommendation would you have for us? Um, so I, I can tell you things that I have recently read and really enjoyed, um, accidentally engaged by, <gasps> um, have you, have you guys read that yet? I just bought it. So oh, I'm excited okay. to read it. <laughs> The Farah Heron, uh, I, th- I think I'm saying her last name wrong, and <laughs> but I think it's Heron. Farah Heron, um, accidentally engaged, totally delightful, completely. Uh, you know, it's um, it's it's set in this building in Toronto, and it's a fake engagement set on a cooking show. So can it get any better than that? But I think the most <laughs> lovely part is um, is is Rina, the main character, actually both of them, their voice, that it's such a, it's funny. Like it's this, it's just really lovely and funny and touching. And I feel like Farah's really come into, um, come into her own, it's her second book and it's just splendid. And then date The Dating Plan, which is um, Sarah Desai, comes out, no, came out last week. So it's, I, I forget what month we're in. <laughs> so it's another, it's, I'm just so thrilled to have these South Asian romances that are so just bananas funny and, um, you know, and bantery and have these, uh, you know, completely messy uh, yet lovely heroines and, uh, you know, these incredibly hot uh, heroes and are getting into all sorts of situations that are sexy and 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 over the top funny so I, mean, I think this is what I've been, I wish I had had this when I was a young woman and uh, loved romantic comedies and did inhale them but I would have loved to see these are the heroines I would have loved to see oh uh, I'm, I'm so actually good. um reading the marriage game right now by Sarah Desai and I have the dating plan it's so much fun I'm having a really good time reading it yeah Yeah. the dating plan also has moments when I was just like you know laughing out loud I was just just hilarious it's just fabulous both of them I love them can't wait great well this was wonderful such a delight to have you on thank you so much for joining us um please let us uh pl- let our listeners know where can people find you and follow you on social media so i um, am at sonalidev.com um and all my social media contacts are on there i do instagram a lot facebook a lot i'm very you know almost non-existent on twitter but you can find <laughs> me there if you have a microscope <laughs> but uh and a compass but those are um so instagram uh and uh facebook and then i have uh, if you are a reader that uh, you know and you want to talk my you know my books and you know talk to me about them then i have a reader group called 
Dev Nation, so Dev Nation uh, on Facebook. And I also have a newsletter that, um, that I call the three R's. So it is recipes, recommendations, and a really bad joke. And, <laughs> um, my family sends those to me in group chats and I thought I should share. And if you, when you um, sign up for my newsletter, you get a free um, e-recipe book. So there's, because books are a large part of my life and of my, um, food is a large part of my life and my books. And so those are the ways I also give, you know, do these, um, I've been giving away a lot of arcs on my Instagram account. And I've been teaming up with other authors that I'm excited uh, about their books. And so we've, I've been doing these joint arc giveaways and we just ended one um, for Denny um Bryce's new book which is another one that's I'm really excited for people to read Wild Women and um uh, The Blues thank you Wild oh. Women and the Blues. I just had a brain um fart but yeah so uh, you can find me on Instagram Facebook my newsletter that newsletter sounds so fun I'm definitely yes. gonna <laughs> sign up well thanks again for joining us Thank you so much Thank for you. having me. This was so fun. This was the yeah. best procrastination fun. Yay. <laughs> Glad we could help. <laughs> Thank you. And also, oh no. <laughs> now get back, get back to writing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh, so that's our show. Every book she mentioned will be in our show notes, as well as links to her website. You'll definitely want to get all of her books, which are available uh, as physical copies, obviously, also ebooks and audiobooks. And don't forget, the April Book of the Month picks are up now. You can get your first box for $9.99 with our promo code, what you should read, all one word. Yes, and be sure to follow us on social media, WISR underscore podcast on Instagram and on Twitter. Find us on Goodreads, and you can also email us at what you should read podcast at gmail.com. And now you know what you should read. You're welcome. You know what you should read? 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 It's time for what you should read. The podcast all about the titles you need. Join three book lovers and a guest as they cover all the best new titles to enjoy with your tea. I have that, but I haven't read it yet. <laughs>